Great, thanks, thanks, Carol, and thanks to the Skyscraper Museum for the opportunity to talk about Jinmao and its impact on other super talls in the world, um, but, but perhaps more importantly, on on um, on a platform for design. And uh, before I start, I'd like to reflect just for a moment on Les Robertson and his contributions. And what I'd like to say is that it really was an honor to know him and it was certainly an honor to see him uh, practice in a way that was creative and inspirational. Um, and maybe mo more, most importantly, um, it gave a broader audience a chance to see engineering. Um, through his creativity, but also through his personality and his commitment to the built environment. So we certainly miss less and certainly carry on his, his thinking as, as we go forward and, uh, and really try to come up with new ideas for not just tall buildings, but, but structures of all types. So today I'm going to talk about um, Jin, Jin Mal's influence and my hope is to, is to talk to you about the story of the design and, and how important it was, not just to China, but to the international um, world of design. And it started with a master plan in an area called Pudong. This was a new development zone that was identified in the late 1980s. And the, the, the image on the left shows the placement of Jin Mao um, along the Wangpu River. There were very few buildings built at that time. In fact, when I visited the site for the first time and I took this photograph from a construction trailer, um, this is what I saw. It, it was a neighborhood. The scale of the, of the place was very modest, but the ambitions were, were, were quite, quite high. And in 1993, SOM, won a competition to design this tower. And it wasn't just a tall building, but the spirit of design had synergy in the architecture. Um, the idea that uh, the building was uh, 88 stories tall, but the exterior wall system was a multiple of eights. And many people don't know that until you study this building. So the register at the base of the building is 16 stories it reduces by one eighth to 14, then to 12, then to 10, then to eight. And then it reduces by a story one eighth of that. So seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The summation is 88. So it wasn't just um, about an 88 story building that was 422 meters tall, but it was about the spirit of design that could possibly get into such a structure. Um, it was, a, it was a great time for SOM to uh, find a new market, um, especially in a place with high ambitions. And the image on the left is Adrian Smith with the, the first, um, one of the first plots of, 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 of the tall building lineup uh, of Jin Mao relative to other tall buildings in the world. At the time of the design, it would have been the third tallest building in the world. Um, before it was over, the Petronas Towers took over uh, that slot, uh, so it dropped to fourth. Today, it's, it's far back in the, in the series, but certainly an important building. The design team uh, on the right, the senior design team at the time, including Peter Weissmantel, um, who many of you met through this series um, a few lectures ago, um, and Stan Carista on the left, who was the uh, structure, senior structural engineer in charge uh, at SOM for the design. So I was part of a great team of structural engineers, including uh, Ahmed Abdelrazak, who will, um, will, will be the, the grand finale uh, lecturer in this series. He'll talk about the construction of super talls. But Stan uh, led this team of, of, of ambitious engineers and, and we, we, we set out uh, to come up with an idea that also worked with the synergy of this tower. Um, and uh, the idea was based on creating an office building at the base and a hotel at the top, but then using a structural system that would find its way through the entire building without transfers, but could create um, 
marketable spaces uh, and also create exciting spaces, especially in the hotel. Um, the full floor plate at the base of the building for, for the office with, with a very, very regular layout and an open floor plan. And then using this atrium space up in the hotel at the top where the building tapers. When we started the project, we did not have a structural system that you see today. In fact, we had a cruciform shaped uh, core with a perimeter steel moment frame that had many, many columns around the shape. And uh, at the time of design, I, I wondered whether or not we could have the same synergy with our structure as we did with the architecture. So I imagined that um, this, this sequence of eights could somehow come into the, the idea of the design. And in fact, over a series of, of uh, meetings internally, we came up with an idea to first take the cruciform core and make it an octagon, eight-sided. And then get rid of, by getting rid of the perimeter frame, we imagined that we could come up with large columns, mega columns that could be interconnected to the core um, at certain locations along the height of the building. And then we would add eight additional steel columns to round out the geometry. And those steel columns would be the ones that would taper with the form. This was the first time that a building of this scale ever uh, used this type of a system of a core connected to these large columns through outriggers. A very simple idea, a, an idea of using um, a lever kind of concept of, of, of connecting those, those strong forms together. Um, and I'm happy to say and most proud of the fact that we see many, many buildings today using this type of system not just in China, but in other places around the world. It's very efficient. The load paths are direct. We're balancing uh, gravity loads to these large elements and using them to withstand overturning. And we're linking the core to the outside columns through these strong trusses uh, for lateral loads. The foundation system was a challenge. In fact, the water table for the site was essentially at grade. We used an idea of long uh, open section steel pipe piles that we would drive from the surface, but the tip elevations for those piles were almost an American football field below the surface. They were 78 meters, a little bit over 78 meters below the surface. And what we did is we prepared the site. We created slurry walls around the perimeter to block the water off so that we could excavate later. We drove the piles from the surface with followers. So there were three sections that were welded together and the fourth was the, was the final drive that would put it into position. The site was, was, um, was something that uh, grew from uh, being a very sort of quiet and direct pile testing type situation um, to the full blown construction. And during the entire process, this man, Stan Carista, was leading the way um, this was, this was uh, a very important part of, of the process because the design was happening uh, out of SOM Chicago. We were building it in Shanghai. It was really the first time somebody was trying to do something of, of this great scale. And he was stubborn, uh, in particular, and te technically excellent in terms of thinking how we might build this building in a place that had never done a building of this scale uh, before. And he was instrumental about the safety of systems and foundation, deep foundation systems in, in, a, in very poor upper level soils. And those piles were driven to this elevation where we found them and prepared them for the mat foundation, which was four meters thick, so half, half, uh, half of eight. So the entire system, eight mega columns, octagon shaped core, the floor framing was a multiple of eight, foundation system uh, was, a, was, a, was a half of an eight, was all part of that same spirit that, that our architects uh, used in winning the original competition. We studied the mat analytically. We built a mock-up of, of the reinforcement in the mat foundation, and we surveyed it. We predicted that the settlement, overall settlement of this tower would be somewhere around 80 millimeters. 
the solid line, the solid darker line that you see in the image uh, is, is the last time we received uh, data from the site. It was not completely a, a long-term uh, case, but it was well after the building uh, was finished. And you can see that we were still above that point that we had predicted. Uh, over time, uh, we're certain that the deflection was, was very close to what we predicted. And it was very regular across the site. It dished in the center underneath the tower mat, which is what we expected and tapered toward the edges. So the outrigger system was, was very important. And what we discovered is that you couldn't just build this building uh, conventionally because the building would creep and shrink under its own weight. And uh, the outside mega columns would creep differentially to the core. So if we were to connect the trusses together, we would find that the stress levels were so high that we would add material and then find we couldn't design it, add more material, make it stiffer, and we'd find that we couldn't design it. So we had to come up with a way, a creative way uh, to build, build the structure. Wind loads um, in Shanghai are significant. There are typhoons. It's not as, as, as significant as, say, Taipei. Um, but uh, the wind actually uh, did control the overall design, the drifts of the building that you see here. Um, one thing that I'll note, and, and Ahmed may talk about this in, the, in his last lecture, is that at the time of this design, the, the Chinese building code actually for wind, from what my, my recollection, was, was up to about 160 meters. So we were way above that point, and we needed to extrapolate the Chinese code up but then we also verified um, the, uh, uh, the building in the wind tunnel. And I'll show you some slides of that in a moment. We also, of course, looked at seismicity. And we looked at two cases, the frequent uh, earthquake and, and the maximum uh, credible earthquake. We found that, um, that uh, through our design, we would keep the outriggers essentially elastic, even in that maximum credible earthquake. But we found that the demand from the wind, the base shear um, in the system, uh, was more significant than, than, uh, than the earthquake itself. It is in a moderate earthquake zone, um, it's zone seven, for those of you that, that have designed in, um, uh, in China. So it was this interaction between um, a building that if we built it with only a core, um, it would deflect far too much. That light blue line that you see in the graph is, is the building uh, with a core only system. The outriggers tended to build, bring the building drift back to an acceptable level. Um, and the force levels we studied very carefully at different moments along the height of the building in those outside columns because they were uh, very important to uh, the, both the stiffness and strength of the, of the tower. This interconnection um, was essential for us to get it right. So we, we looked at the building um, under wind loadings for two conditions. The first was um, we called the existing condition. So if you remember the photograph that I showed you about the site, that is what we had found when we first started the project. So the image on the left, existing condition. The image on the right is what we call developed Pudong. And Pudong was, as I showed you in, the, um, in that very first slide, was, was, uh, was under a master plan. And there were very uh, tall buildings that were, um, were, were being considered uh, close by to Jinmao. And as all of us know, those two buildings have been built. But at the time, all we knew about those tall buildings were, were, were these images here to the right. In fact, they're taller, much taller than we modeled. But what we did find was that the Jinbao Tower saw 20% additional demand because of those uh, two taller towers upstream, upstream in the wind, um, and we designed for it. So we designed for that condition. We studied carefully the, the construction of the building. Um, the image in the middle is a hand drawing uh, actually a hand drawing that I did uh, in trying to, to, to understand how the building would be built, how the core would go ahead, how the steel would follow. We used all of this in our calculations to try to figure out what the creep and shrinkage effects, uh, and elastic shortening effects for the tower uh, were and how we might design um, those trusses for that, as well as keeping the floors uh, flat um, at the time of, of occup occupation. Um, the image on the left is that 
is that we had a rigorous program of building this building to design elevation. And uh, you know, everybody might say, well, that's what we always do um, in a tall building. But in fact, the building is moving as you build it. So what we, did, what we defined was a design elevation on our drawings that we mandated that the building be built to so that corrections could be made along the way when we reached, for instance, the 55th floor. And then we corrected from there. So we, we created a benchmark that was very important. We had a mix of materials, as Carol uh, mentioned earlier, um, steel was, was a predominant um, material in these tall buildings up until probably the, 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 the 80s and early 90s. And this is a great example of mixing all of those materials together reinforced concrete core, composite columns with steel and concrete, and then steel columns all on the same floor plan. So a Saturday night project with my daughter, who is, um, is now just a bit over 30 years old. So it gives you a sense of um, where we are with time. Um, and um, there is a, a, you'll see that there is a, a beer bottle behind. <laughs> so. So this was uh, it was one of those rare moments where you could you could spend a Saturday night and 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 maybe relax a little bit, but also uh, come up with a way to model a, a major component of the building, and um, and and this this model of tongue depressors and uh, and popsicle sticks and and wood dolls was was the key to that, and this model uh, was 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 made so that I could prove to myself, but also prove to other members of our team, including Stan, that we had a great um, idea, that we could come up with um, a, an idea where we would create the trusses uh, to act like mechanisms, free moving mechanisms during construction, and then we would lock all the joints off. And we created slots in the diagonals that, that helped us achieve that. We used pins on the horizontal, that didn't attract any bending moment so they could freely rotate. And we would allow the relative displacement to occur after we installed the members, but before we put all the final connections in place to resist wind and seismic forces. So these drawings were created and they're all hand drawings. Um, this is something that was done um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a series of sittings, so to speak. And the way for me to, to think of this was to come up with a way to describe the motion of what this truss would do at the top of the building. This is, um, excuse me, this is at the bottom of the building, at the mid height of the building, and then at the top of the building. So all conditions were drawn, all of those, um, those, those three segments of, of outrigger connections were drawn. They were two stories and uh, buried in uh, these diagrams are calculations and, and, um, and bolt patterns that all became part of the working drawings. So from the, uh, from the popsicle stick model to the final working drawing to Grand Towers fabrication uh, plant in Shanghai, where we created um, a prefit mock-up before we took these big pieces of, uh, of hardware out to the site, to um, the image on the lower left is Al Kashaba, um, a site engineer for SOM standing next to one of the connections for one of the trusses. And you can see the pinholes um, that were in place uh, to allow for the, the, the initial erection and the mechanized movement. So it was a feat that went remarkably well. Um, the composite construction proved to be a very efficient, a very smart way to design the building. Um, it, it, was, it was a collective effort, no doubt. Um, SOM worked with Syater uh, on the left for most of the initial design and, and about midway through the design, Caddy was involved. It's a group on the right. Um, collaborators in, in, in foundation design, in, in, uh, in superstructure, uh, in engineering, in wind engineering, foundation engineering. It was, it was a very great uh, way to, to imagine all of the potential difficulties that we might see in a design like this. Uh, there were other important players. And for those of you that saw Peter Weissmantle's lecture a few times ago, uh, in this series, he was the technical design architect on the project, and he was embedded in, um, in, in all of the concepts from, 
very early on, all the way through, uh, through construction. Shen Fu on the left, um, she, she was involved with the design of the project and has grown to be one of our partners at SOM. Uh, she, she saw the project all the way through and, and had a great relationship with our client um, and has gone on to lead many, many projects in China uh, ever since. Luke Leong on the right uh, is now the director of our, our high performance design group and MEP group at SOM. Uh, he did the mechanical engineering uh, for the project and, and, and led the, the overall design team for the building services. So we created something that still today, I, I believe is loved. Um, we allowed people to have a glimpse of, of, of the structure for this building. Um, I think the atrium, it's a Grand Hyatt Hotel. So I welcome you to stay there if you have a chance to do that sometime. Um, I think it's still one of the tallest, if not the tallest uh, hotels in the world that has an internal atrium uh, like this. The mega columns that are five meters by 1.5 meters at the base are, are celebrated in the lobby as you enter. So you can see them and get a sense of scale relative to the core um, as you enter. Um, the, the outrigger system and the connection to the, the spire at the top, which houses a lot of the uh, mechanical engineering spaces and so mechanical spaces, um, you, can, you can get a sense of what that structure is at the observation deck. But it didn't stop there. And, and that's, that's probably the most important part of this lecture, I suppose, is that you know, we used it as an influence for uh, many other buildings. And Brian Lee um, was involved with this project and he's also been part of the series and imagining um, the geometric definition of a super tall building and looking at local expertise. You know, how can we build, um, how can we both get inspired by um, local culture, but also how can we use local expertise to, to build a building like this? And what we found in Tangen was that there were factories that were building uh, plate steel, thin, thin plate steel for, automobiles, for uh, appliances, for the military perhaps, and uh, ships. We, we were inspired by the fact that this steel could perhaps be used in a tall building in a unique way where we would use outrigger trusses similar to Jin Mao, but we would create a plated system. And we imagined that the structure could be made completely out of plate. We tested it. We created a plated shear wall in the center that linked those outriggers together. And we proved that a building like this could be done. And I know that this uh, system has been used before in other places around the world, but this is the tallest we believe still in the world where we not only use this plated system of this local material in the walls in the center, but we also used it for every other component. The beams were built up out of plate steel. The columns used plate steel that were bent into some circular sections and filled with concrete. But what's important about this is that we created an architecture that was very valuable. In fact, it's one of the most valuable buildings in China because of the spaces that we created on the outside of the building, especially. They're column free, they project out and they provide great internal use, but also great views. So at 369 meters tall, um, it's, it's a, it was a landmark at the moment that it was built. It's still very successful, very proud of, um, of this building in Tangen. And another a building designed by Brian and Bill Baker and others uh, is part of, of the continued legacy of, of, of super talls and using this mega column concept. So the idea of this very strong core linked to the outside, in this case, through diaphragms, not through outriggers, uh, to these larger columns at the perimeter. And these columns conceived of, 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 of steel filled with concrete, but carefully placed to work with the architecture and also with the force flows throughout the height of the building. So a building that's expressive in a way, perhaps more so than, than Jin Mao, um, but one that uses the same type of principle of that outrigger system um, concept, although in this case, the outrigger connectors were not there, uh, 
but the mega column piece was there um, to combine with the, with the core. The other thing that was important about the design of, of Jin Mao was the natural behavior that we believed we were, we were achieving with these mechanized trusses. And we began to think about structures in our body and how our body works and how do joints in, in buildings work relative to what our body uh, does in terms of its performance. And using an idea of a pin, this case, not free moving, free sliding, but a pin in the web of a beam with a plated connection that was bolted with a friction material that allowed for slip when you, only when you needed it. So for example, in a, in a building that sees high seismicity, for the most part, the building is, ha is acting elastically throughout its life. But when the earthquake comes, we get plastic behavior in the beams protecting the columns. But in the current design, those beams are damaged and the building is either repaired or needs to be replaced after a major earthquake. So why not think about dissipating energy through friction with a pseudo elastic behavior and then allowing the building to go through the earthquake, dissipate the energy and come back to zero because there's still elastic strain energy that lives within the frames. So a building frames might look like this in the future, slipping only when needed in a high seismic event, but remaining fixed for most of the building service life. And if we can create these joints out of conventional building materials, wide flange shapes, pins that perhaps are made out of hollow sections, uh, high strength bolts and friction pads that exist between the curved surfaces, we've got a connection that we can predict the threshold of slip, but then also a connection that allows for the dissipation of energy when we most need it in high demands. So that natural response from Jid Mao was the inspiration behind these joints. And the joints uh, could also live in different configurations. So braces, for example, that are typically not very ductile in an earthquake. And rotation joints that are in a circular fashion that are clamped and, and, and dissipate energy when, uh, when the major event uh, occurs. So fairly simple joints, simple connections, using the principles of physics and, and understanding um, uh, um, the behavior of friction and creating joints that uh, slide when we want them to slide. So we design a lot of tall buildings and uh, it, that are shear walls and concrete. Perhaps the link beams are done with this butterfly pattern of a joint um, that initially is, is clamped together. So we have uh, a friction connection, but it's allowed to move uh, during that high seismic event. And instead of replacing our link beams, which we'll have to after a major event, if they're conventionally reinforced, we can use this plated system um, and the building remains in service. The idea of the pin was also an influence for controlling behavior in this tall building. It's not a super tall building, but it's one that, that shows um, the, the behavior, the free moving behavior of a structure in, in an area of high seismicity, in this case, Beijing. We suspended um, a museum from the heart of this atrium. Um, the building is, a, is an office building and uh, the atrium is, is one that has an internal connection between office bars. Um, but we use this cable system to hold up, which what we believe still is the tallest cable net in the world. It's 90 meters tall and 60 meters wide. And we referred back to an idea of, 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 of a pulley and the idea that a major cable running underneath a pulley, even if the frame is moving back and forth, the amount of additional uh, tension that goes into those cables is very, very minimal. In fact, it's theoretically zero if everything is symmetrical um, and there's no friction at the, at the pulley itself. But our architects were not interested in a 20 foot diameter pulleys. That's what we would have needed for the size of cable that we were using. 
So we built a model and that model had springs and it had a lever that we called the rocker. It had four pins in it. And moving this frame back and forth, if, if, the, if the, 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 the springs didn't elongate, then we had no force, no additional force in the cables. And, and, and that was the proof that we could have this frame and allow it to move back and forth freely with the use of this rocker mechanism. And so what we did is we created a way to connect the, uh, the, the, the cable net wall to the frame of the building, the outside frame, but also to these diagonal cables that supported the, the museum. And we created a rocker that allows for that movement during a seismic event. And what you'll note is that there's a pin at the very bottom of this rocker, and that allows for movement left and right because we can get an earthquake from any direction. So freeing up that joint was very important. If we didn't free it up, it would have acted like a gigantic braced frame. And we would have put, and we try to do this, we put more material into the diagonals and we found that it attract more force. Put more material, attracted more force. So the only way for us to design for this reasonably was to free it up and create this mechanism. Natural force flow within structures is very important. And a few years ago, we, we um, began developing some ideas of thinking of tall buildings, not as beams and columns, but as perhaps uh, membranes or volumes. And we used a topology optimization and material density analyses to come up with a way to define where the structure should be in this case, with a square form with a point load um, at the top of the building. And what we found was the bracing system was not concentric. That in fact, it was a system that was uh, proportional uh, to three quarters and one quarter of the height of a particular uh, module. And in doing this, we found that the, the amount of material required for that frame was quite low. In fact, it was, was lower than the concentric braced frame. But we didn't stop there. Uh, the theoretical uh, uh, definition is, is one perhaps on the left, but in this case for the Siddic Tower in Shenzhen, we densified the frame, but then we, we, we stretched the frame. So in the area of the building at the top where we have residential and hotel spaces, we stretched it, removed the density of members on the outside of the building, and then, and conversely, we, we did the opposite at the base where we have an office space, we have demand that's higher and you can see that the density of the framing members are also higher. But what was very important that we discovered in this exercise was the idea of fusing the building during an earthquake and creating ductile links within the system. I use the analogy of, 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 of designing for wind where stiffness is very important and diagonal members are very a very good way of achieving that stiffness. The earthquake on the other hand is something where you have to achieve softness at a certain point. So the ductile links combined with the front based frame gives you both. It gives you the stiffness that you need for let's say the service life, normal service life. The links give you the ductility that you need in the major earthquake. So we imagine that these links could be conventional like the, the image on the top left, or it might use this idea of the fused pin. Um, in both cases, creating ductility where we need it within the building frame. And what we found is that buildings of the future might look very different than the most efficient buildings that not only SOM has designed, but other engineers and architects around the world. In this case, case the John Hancock Center in Chicago. By, by using these tools and imagining this natural force, force flow that, that, that yields to these types of results. Now, the interesting thing is that you can take this idea and use it on the horizontal. So we're constantly looking for the application of, of this in other places. So we're using this technique. Uh, you could imagine a simple span where you, where you take the building, the tall building, and you, and you mirror it about the center point. 
And that's what the idea here is. And the replacement of a conventional trust, like a Warren trust, we're imagining this optimized trust. In this case, a circular uh, pattern that uh, we're analyzing to start, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be a square, um, it could be a triangular form. And what we found is that even uh, if you imagine this in, in, in concrete or steel, that this optimized placement of material is quite beautiful and, um, and, and, and it yields very efficient results. In fact, we had um, about a 20% reduction in material compared to a conventional truss. Now, there are a few more members and the geometry is a little bit different to make, to, you know, to erect um, and, and to fabricate, but we believe that this kind of technique um, is, is an idea uh, for the future in some of our long span bridges. We also um, are imagining how some of these ideas can be applied to buildings of all scales. So whether they're super talls or they're modest uh, buildings of just a handful of stories, how can we come up with a way to consider these optimized um, behaviors of, 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 of structure and in this case, apply it to the slab systems. So in a, in a fairly regular building in San Francisco, a residential building with a reinforced concrete core and a series of columns around the perimeter, we analyzed the system using the same topology optimization technique. And we found that the force flows were not linear. So the, for, the force flow from the columns to the core actually are in a curved pattern. And what we did is we, is we mapped that curved pattern with post-tensioning. And we found that we could reduce the material in those slabs by 25%. For the, for the engineers on the call, the, there's been a challenge for many, many years, and that is to how to get your post-tensioning down to a lower value beyond one pound per square foot or 0.9 pounds per square foot. It's been almost impossible. We can ban post-tensioning. We can, we can, we can group post-tensioning in a way that is, is trying to get directly to um, points of support. But we, we constantly find that we're, we, we, we haven't gotten a key. Uh, we think this is the key. And, and so what we've done is we've mapped this, this optimized pattern. And the way we imagined it, the way we defined it, was like a, a musical staff. We mapped it in plan with the geometry that we needed relative to the analysis. And we mapped it in elevation. That's the, um, that's the drawing on the, on the bottom. So that you can, you can know everything you need to in placing those tendons all in one spot. And the tendon placement is quite reasonable, rational. And we curve post-tensioning tendons anyway when we anchor them in our buildings. But this was a technique to create something that in the end was very reasonable to build. We mapped it, we defined it for every plan, and we gave the cable layouts to the contractor as well as the anchors for the exterior wall. The building is almost finished now, but we think it's a good example of taking these kinds of inspirations into the horizontal surfaces of our buildings. We wonder about optimization beyond structures. And this is an example of considering optimizing, not, not structural material, but, but perhaps the way people move through cities. So this is a, a study. Uh, the size of the, of, of the support is, 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 is in, in line with density. So the urban center in the, in the center of this, this diagram has 500,000 jobs. So let's say 500,000 people uh, are working in that particular area. The subcenters have less. So we analyze this in the same way that we do structures. And what we find is that the force flows are not necessarily linear. There's an organic pattern that exists and, and appears that allows for um, street patterns perhaps that are not linear, that, that, that leads to um, a more efficient way of moving people from point to point. And it depends on the size of the support and where the support is located. So you can mutate the idea and, and push the lower left support in toward the center and you find that there's a different flow pattern that emerges. So we think that there's great opportunity to take these ideas and bring them into other disciplines. 
um, as we look for the most optimal way of moving material and structure, or, or in this case, people. Um, we've, we've taught, we've tried to teach, we think hopefully successfully teach this in a studio setting. And we've also exhibited the work around the world in, in terms of how we think about uh, not just tall buildings, but, but buildings of all scales. And, and to show people uh, how beautiful structure really can, can be. And, and as part of this, there, there was a book that, that was written that I, that I wrote. Um, it's, it is about SOM. It's about SOM buildings. Um, it's about uh, a, a blank sheet of paper, so to speak, in the beginning through these sort of complex ideas. Um, and, and maybe most importantly, it's about uh, structure as architecture. You know, uh, how beautiful structure can be um, and how well it can interact with, with architecture is the hope of what the book describes. Um, so anyway, if you're interested, that book is available um, on, on, on Amazon and other places. And um, it, it tells, I think, a fairly decent story about the, 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 the whole journey in design. Um, Jim Mao has gotten quite a bit of um, you, you know, attention over the years, there's no doubt. Um, but I, I have to say that the person that's the second from the left, um, his, his name is Mr. Fan Guao Kuo, okay? He is the, he was, he's now retired, but he was the chief engineer for Shanghai Construction Company. And it was his will, I believe, that we were able to achieve what we did. Um, he was an engineer, he is an engineer, and he worked very closely with us. And he believed that we, could accomplish this. And I think that I give him a great deal of credit in, in bringing this building forward for, for all of us. Um, the building is, um, is loved and it, uh, it, people uh, experience it in different ways. I have not done this and uh, I don't know if anybody on the call has ever tried to do this, but um, the skywalk at the 88th floor was something that was uh, installed after um, the building was finished. But um, it, it just gives you an example of, of, of how this building has been used over the years. And, um, and there are things that have happened since then. Um, this is scale, these are scale models of, of, of two favorites, I suppose, Jin Mao and, and the Burj Khalifa. And you can see the difference in scale um, over just a handful of years. But what's next? You know, what what are we thinking about? What are others thinking about? Um, I think behavior, uh, as Stan would always say, is the most important. So force flows. This is a, a model of a, a core wall building with outriggers, and it almost looks like the human body when you map the force flows and tension and compression through the the the, 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 the midsection and out through the arms. Uh, imagining that uh, there are, are hinging points for seismicity uh, that, that occur along that, that core. And, and then thinking of post-tensioning vertically in those systems and how we might map force flows with, with, with that uh, material to make the, the, the structure more efficient. And then of course, um, you know, the beautiful things around us and, and what happens to an idea when you consider these uh, natural patterns and, and, you know, the idea is they, they, they should be uh, unrestrained, you, you know, so as we, as we try to conceive of these buildings of the future um, and how one uses space, and I, I, I suppose I should have been um, listening to the sermon, by the way, so some of those of you that go to uh, some church, maybe not now, it's not so easy to do that, but um, these are drawings that were sort of part of my experience for that Sunday morning. But, but this idea that, that, um, that, that there is a synergy in structure for, for the tall building idea, and we're learning about how these, uh, these ideas are added. So this is a braced system that you could imagine is fused right down the center for seismicity. It also has outriggers, uh, the ones that uh, are shown in the, the image on the right-hand side. And what's most important is it uses the mega column it uses a closed form core that's good for torsion. It uses an idea that, uh, that 
that elevatoring can be done both in the core for let's say elevators that have to go from top to bottom, and then perhaps on the sides where elevators can drop off. And then when they drop off, we can create really unique spaces um, outside of that, uh, we'll say building proper uh, that's shown in blue um, that, are, that are perhaps more public spaces, more interactive spaces. So these are ideas that we, that we see in a design like this where, where structure is well considered um, and then these spaces um, are, 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 are interacting, so to speak, with that structure. And the, the beauty of scale, um, uh, the, the idea of carrying on with this mega column scheme and the scale of, of lobby spaces that allow the users to experience that, similar to what we did on Jin Mao, um, the core uh, and the outside frame. Uh, and then an image of, of, of that concept for, for that super tall building. Thinking of structure combined with other um, ideas right from the very beginning, the form, the efficiency of the floor plate, the carbon that's being emitted when we build that building and solar exposure. So coming up with parametric modeling that allows us to plan cities in a way that take on all of these uh, parameters, not just density and not just uh, sun and shadow, but, but what is the value? What's the true value of our buildings and what are we emitting when we build them? So structures might look very different in the future. They might be more influenced on our surroundings in a way that is both efficient and beautiful. And the structures in, in this lineup are, are all very rational structures. The, the, the two uh, drawings, sets of drawings on the right are maybe more predictable um, or, 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 or have been done before. But the one on the left somehow looks much different, much more beautiful, much more organic based on these principles that we've been talking about. And I think that that idea of natural behavior going back to the behavior of Jin Mao and how um, we imagine how these buildings might be built in the future is something that really excites us. And so we wonder about it. We wonder about how these systems um, get developed even in the next steps as we go forward uh, in design and construction. And with a great thanks, um, we look back at this team of people led by our client um, the three gentlemen that are in the center of the photograph uh, for the, you know, for, for the, the sort of the belief that, that this, this idea could happen. And I don't think anybody knew at the time how impactful the building would be um, on the future of design and structural systems and construction and the growth in China. But this is where it all started. Um, so thanks. Uh, everyone for the opportunity to tell the story and um, and and I, I, I welcome questions if you have some and um, Carol thank you very much again uh, for, for the chance to talk to talk about it thank you Mark a, a, a fabulous talk and you took us from history to the future uh, as SOM always does focus on in innovating. Um, as Bill Baker made clear in his talk as well, the idea of, of finding um, both structural logic and structural clarity and then thinking of new ways to do that is such an important part um, of your architecture. And you, I'm glad you showed your book and I certainly um, suggest everybody go to that for, uh, for a much, much fuller story. Uh, and you, you do explain so, so clearly how different um, systems of thinking uh, uh, inform a new way of, of thinking about structure. Um, I'm going to press you a little more about the history, though, since, since you, after all, did work um, 20 years ago on, um, or 30 years ago, excuse me, on this project. Um, so you were there, and so you can ask her, ask her my historian's questions, because it does seem to me that Jin Mao was an enormously influential building in the ways that you described. Um, but also in ways that I would describe as um, someone who's focused in particular on the, um, the, the commercial 
motive and the realization of the architecture through so many constraints of government or codes or um, economics, basically. Uh, and, and then there's also this kind of other factor, it seems to me, of the moment of Jin Mao. And so, um, so you filled in something of, of the history of the project. And if my slides hadn't um, frozen, I would have showed sections of, of Jin Mao and, and focused on the, the construction of the core and then um, the hotel where I have stayed in the, um, in the Grand Hyatt. And I certainly recommend everybody if you go to, to Shanghai to stay there because the, the thrill of that atrium void is undeniably architecture. And it's, it's just a it's just spectacular space that even if it had been done before um, by other architects, one thinks of John Portman and his, 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 those, those great kind of chasm um, uh, voids uh, that are so monumental and, and thrilling as spaces. Um, but Jin Mao also stands in this kind of um, mixed use model that mm -hmm. takes over, especially in China. Um, as the predominant way to realize the practical ambition of a modern uh, super tall with the multi functions of office, residence, hotel. Um, and, 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 and that very practical kind of uh, form follows finance aspect of, of making projects work, um, it seems to me is, is solved uh, it with in the prototype of Jin Mao and then realized in a number of other buildings that have hotel, hotels at the top very much like them. Um, so that, that's one aspect is just is um, talking just a little bit more about the, the program of the building and how the engineers um, thought about that. And then the other thing is the connection to postmodernism in the, in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, of course, now that we've lived through Pudong's development and you showed us the swamp from which that tower was the, the first to grow. Um, now that uh, Pudong has realized the trio of super talls that were originally part of, of that master plan for the new business district, uh, we have Shanghai World Financial Center and Shanghai Tower. And it's, it's always explained, um, I think mostly by the Chinese clients and maybe by the architects, that these represent the past, present, and future of, of Chinese architecture in their imagery, right? So that um, Jin Mao is kind of, you know, um, kind of fluffed off as a pagoda, um, extent, an attenuated pagoda. Uh, and that, that connection to Chinese tradition and architecture is a, a kind of imageability that you might think of as Chinese, but you might also in a, in a broader stylistic era of skyscraper development, think of as um, postmodern as one would think, I think, of Petronas Towers in their, um, their imageability, their, their silhouette. Um, as just as having a kind of decorative function that connects to the history of architecture that was being very consciously revived in the 1980s, um, I guess, and, and into the 90s with postmodernism, when the tension was existing between SOM's modernism and the and the postmodernism of the of the era. Uh, so it, you know, in that way, is is how how um, how does that tension between innovation and, and uh, developing a new prototype and a new structural system in order to realize that, that um, architectural iconicity uh, play with the, tra the traditional, um, you know, kind of grounding of imageability, um, historicity, and iconicity. Good, really two good questions, and I'll, I'll start with the, um the commercial side, the programmatic side of it. And I'll give you my, my impression of, of some of the major moves that, that we made. Um, certainly it was a destination at that moment in time. It was a place that that building needed to be a place where people wanted to visit it, be part of it, maybe work in it. Um, what I didn't talk about tonight was the retail area. There's a large retail podium. Um, and the retail podium started out 
sort of tr trying to find its way because the density was so sparse in Pudong. But I will say that um, the combined idea of, of mixed use and there, there is 53 stories of office and 35 stories of hotel was one that um, in the end, I think proved to be uh, very, a very uh, smart, a very important decision. In fact, uh, it, it, the 10 year mark of the completion, the building was completed in, in 99. Um, we, we had a gathering with our client and Peter Weissmantle and I were there, there were others. And it was a very casual, you know, casual dinner. And the client looked across the table at the two of us and he, he said that this was a very significant investment for us. It was very significant. Um, the numbers and, and the people can find uh, perhaps more accurate numbers, but it was somewhere in the order of $500 million at that time as an investment. They said that at that moment in time, they were, they were, in, the, the, they were in the profit zone. They had paid the building off, okay? And, and 10 years of a return on an investment of a building of that scale, I would argue, um, is, is actually quite remarkable. Plus, it was built all um, by local hands, with the exception of major building parts. And that's something that I'd also like to, to, to emphasize, that major building parts came from various places around the world like mechanical systems. They came from Europe. Uh, Gartner did the exterior wall system. So it was a partnership beyond just design. It was a partnership in materials. Now today it's much different, right? Materials are coming locally from China, whether it's stone um, or exterior wall systems and so forth. But at that time, as part of that investment, they needed to bring in this, this expertise. So it was a fairly risky endeavor, really. But I think that mix um, was quite good. In fact, the hotel operator came later in the, in the process, in the history of the evolution. Uh, the building was already under construction and, and, and Hyatt was, was not completely signed on. They came on during, during um, the, the stage of early construction and we re redesigned several areas in the top of the building to accommodate their program. Um, but the other thing I'd note is that, is that uh, the building is, is very well occupied. I've been in touch with, um, with the client group over the years and, and they are almost completely full on the office level, uh, the office portion of the building and also up in the hotel. Their, their, their um, vacancy rates are very, very low. Um, and I think it has to do Really, I'll say in a biased way, the raw design of, of how we created those spaces because um, there's the inside outside at the hotel is, you know, you talked about the atrium. Um, there's this sort of column free space around that core. It's very regular, very usable um, for new tenants. So I think there was a success um, in not just the program, but the attitude toward, toward creating this. We created this you know, this moment at the top of the building, this observation deck, which um, we know there are various versions of that around the world. Um, that was a major part of it. And um, it, it didn't catch on for a while, but, but then, 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 then took off. So I think that the magic of the, the, the mixed use was very, very important versus say an all office building. Plus it, 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 it helped to activate the area. Your second question, and I'm going to leave that to mostly to my architectural colleagues, but what I will say about the design and your reference to postmodernism is that the building is very scientific. If you look at the building purely from an aesthetic point of view, you may come to that conclusion. But if you look at how sophisticated the exterior wall system is and the material, the stainless that was used um, in, in the building, um, and, and the way it was detailed, it was highly complicated. The elevatoring systems are, you know, state of the art. The, you know, the use of um, uh, materials that 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 we used at both the plaza level and in the interiors, where it was all, you know, beautifully done and state of the art. So there's a science to this building that I think is is quite unusual. Um, I think the references that were made um, 
to the synergy, the, 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 the idea that design is, is beyond the just pure aesthetic was very important. Some may say that, that as, you, as you mentioned, that it's a postmodern uh, kind of look. It's, it's a reflective look, perhaps, on, on, a, on a form that is, is very well known. Um, but but I, I think overall, um, the idea of, 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 of the science behind it, the, 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 the ambition behind that building is what um, gives it great strength. And uh, there may be some arguments that that building may still be the favorite of the three. I don't know. I'm not going <laughs> to, won't, I won't, I won't, I won't step into that, uh, that area. I'll let others debate it. But, but in terms of of, of, of China's um, move toward this, this idea of development, maybe it was the right thing. The first right move to, to make in China is an example that, that this type of, of, of ambition could be realized. And we've seen it uh, since then um, in, in many, many ways over the last uh, several years. Yeah, well, I think one thing is the ambition um, the the other is the um, the the establishing a, a prototype, which is a, a workable program that that then becomes that informs the typological development of of the super tall in terms of an, an urban architecture, right? Something something that works commercially um, and uh, and in uh, in an environment where you have to create a, a kind of self-contained urbanism in order to you know to make the business proposition work um, and, and then there is this imageability and you know Adrian Smith gave a talk in our series um, with, uh, where he highlighted more recent work uh, and didn't don't recall if he talked specifically about Jim Mao but the, the, the one thing that seems to me that Adrian is um, not the one thing, one of the things that Adrian is so brilliant um, at doing is creating a story um, of, of an image of a building, um, a, a kind of narrative yes. uh, that is quite a different approach to what you were describing at the end of your lecture, where the, um, the kind of, um, where your image is, an, is a membrane, um, a, a, a structure as a membrane, rather than, let's just take Patronus in, in, instead of Jin Mao, um, a, a, a form which has a formal expression that connects to a kind of popular story that it's an, it, it, there are um, kind of Islamic origins for the geometries. You know, it's a, it's a, a sure. different way of categorizing architectural as well as engineering approaches, it seems to me. Sure. And I, I... I'd like to argue that that uh, great engineering doesn't need to be expressive overtly, although you know we, we certainly love to celebrate it in that way. But it doesn't need need to be. And I think that that a good example might be buildings that you discover, right? So Jim Mao, I would argue, is a building that you discover. You you don't you don't see it right away, you, you know. And and one of the the key points of that building is that um, the proud faces of that, of that building, in fact, it's, if you look at it as you know, cruciform and, and plan as you get to the top, um, is where those large columns live. And they live from the, you know, from the bottom of the building to the top. And you find that there's some kind of synergy going on, although you can't quite see it, right? You get a peek of it when you enter into the building. At the bottom, you go to the top, you see some of it again, but you don't really see it throughout your experience um, versus say a John Hancock building where it's completely clear. So anyway, I would argue that great engineering and great construction uh, of these super talls is one that does not necessarily have to be um, uh, uh, an overt, you know, or a, you know, a, a, a completely expressive response. Um, so, and, and you know, I think that um, that take I, I believe taking that idea to all scales is also very important. Um, and we talked a little bit about how you take these ideas to different scales mm -hmm. um, because that's more common, really. These buildings are so unusual uh, when you think about the life of a concept that 
people dream up to whether it gets built and then those that are that stand today. Well, we're kind of over our time. Um, so I think we need to conclude for tonight. And I will remind people to come back next week when Dennis Poon uh, from Thornton Thomas Seti will talk about a very interesting structure designed by the uh, aforementioned Adrian Smith called uh, Chengdu Greenland. Uh, and then we will have yet another talk by one of the family of the engineers and architects who, who worked on so many of these, um, uh, Ahmed Abdelrazak, who will talk about the St. Petersburg Tower called Lactus Center. And then um, in, in addition, as a special bonus um, for this series, uh, Fred Clark will, will talk about Petronas Towers, where we will, again, focus on um, the history that established this lineage and different and, and, and different strategies in both structure and imagery, as we've been uh, just talking about in creating a, a, um, a kind of evolution of the super tall uh, in the 21st century that clearly goes back into the into very important origins um, in the 20th century. And so, Mark, thank you for adding to um, our knowledge of, of everything, but especially Jin Mao, especially seismicity is a, um, as, as a, uh, such a key consideration and a, a much more difficult problem to solve than you suggested in, you, in the solution that you offered, which is, is uh, brilliant. So uh, you did show us how that carries forward um, into other work and the idea of flows. So you really added a lot to the themes that we'll continue to explore and discuss, but you've filled in a lot of the blanks and what we needed to cover. So thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, you. Yeah. See you next time, guys. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hi, welcome, everybody. Uh, here we are in the 10th of our lecture series on um, designing global super talls, we're called Worldview. And um, tonight we have with us uh, an engineer from the San Francisco office of SOM, Mark Sarkeesian, who has a really fabulous um, uh, story to tell us of the creation um, in both architecture and design um, and that and that integrate the importance of the integration of those things um, of a super tall Jin Mao in Shanghai that really um, starts off um, by my estimation as a historian uh, the kind of typology that plays out and that we've been looking at through the initial um, lectures on the on some of the most recent buildings of the last decade or so. Um, in thinking about the lecture series um, and about our exhibition, Super Tall, I was particularly interested in exploring how the typology of the 21st century uh, is different um, than the 20th, which is the century of steel. Um, and what came so much to the fore in the way that I was absorbing as a, as a lay person, uh, the, the, in, the individual approaches uh, to architectural design, but also especially across the board for, for um, the engineering story and the evolution of um, the various structural systems that, that play out in what becomes, um, a, a, in, in my view, the, the, the century of concrete. Um, I, I looked for, uh, and I asked the engineers in our series, um, what were the origins of these um, structural strategies? And our lecture series, as those of you, you who know um, and have been following the worldview uh, engineering super talls, the second half of our, our series, uh, have uh, been treated to the uh, experience and intelligence of the of engineers, structural engineers from um, across firms uh, and um, the 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 men who have designed all of the world's tallest buildings. Uh, the series uh, is as some of you know, is being dedicated to um, Les Robertson, uh, who died in, in, um, mid, in February, on February 12th uh, of this year, uh, and was a, a great friend to the museum, one of our board members, and of course, uh, one of the world's great structural engineers. And Les's 
humanity in particular um, inspires all of us. And, and so many of the, our speakers have, have paid um, tribute to Les. So this series is dedicated to him. And um, we want to remember him in each of this, this, this series. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Elise uh, uh, Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, who were inspired by Les um, and donated to this series. And so I, I do want to mention to those of you who are enjoying us continuously, um, please think of the Skyscraper Museum uh, and, uh, and um, support this support these investigations because we want to carry them forward in every semester, so to speak, as we take a topic and explore it um, very thoroughly, but with uh, historians, with uh, practitioners, um, and with the people who really understand how these buildings are made. So, um, so less is our inspiration for that. We have been, um, we, moment, um, we have been looking historically at the succession of super talls, as in our exhibition, Super Tall 2020, I invite you to visit that in a virtual version on our exhibition. And the very first section of the chronology of the super talls that you see in, um, in a screenshot from, from our website right here, uh, shows you at the end on the right, uh, Jin Mao Tower, and right next to it, uh, the Patronus Towers. And the um, good news is that we have just added a lecture to this series to continue to explore in especially the history of the late 20th century and how, how super talls globally transitioned into the worldwide proliferation um, that we've seen in the last 20 years. And so um, Fred Clark will be joining us uh, in order to talk about the Pe Caesar Pelly, Fred Clark, and now Pelly Clark Pelly firm uh, who were responsible for this um, first of the um, the world's tallest buildings that took the title away from the United States from Les Robertson's World Trade Center and from uh, SOM's uh, Sears Tower, now Willis Tower, as you see it in, the, um, in this image. Jump forward to introduce and focus on Mark Sarkeesian, uh, who is uh, an engineer, structural engineer at SOM, as I said, in the, in the San Francisco office and has spent some 30 years um, at SOM on a whole variety of building types. Um, his specialty, uh, in addition to, uh, to structure and wind engineering, is also um, seismic uh, issues, which we haven't addressed that much yet. Uh, in the series. And so uh, Mark has a fantastic presentation. And so I think it's best to invite him onto the screen and to get off very quickly um, rather than to worry about my slides. 